so welcome everybody um i'm really excited to see such a big variety of people from from i think more or less the whole of europe which is really really good and so before we'll we'll move on it would be great to just get a little bit of impression about for for us who who's here so first of all i have a question and and you can answer it by putting up your thumbs or just you know, for those of you who are technical, you can put up the, the thumb on the screen. I'm that's too hard for me. So Attila is he is technical, he can do that. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, for those of you, wait a minute, guys, you're too you're too fast, you're too fast. You you're supposed to put up a thumb if you attended the YLG 2016. <laughs> A lot of technical guys here on me. Yes. Great. Um, ooh -hoo. <laughs> so for those of you who were not there, uh, the Young Leaders Gathering in Jakarta in 2016 gathered, I think it was 1,000 people, 1,000 young leaders from, from every nation, uh, at least more or less all the nations of the world. Uh, and it was a fantastic time of, of interacting and getting to know people and lots of new initiatives came out of it and it was very inspiring and uh, yeah. Um, and then since then we've had annually we have had young leaders gatherings in Europe, gathering people from, from a lot of different nations in Europe trying to, you know, the vision being to encourage one another to stand shoulder to shoulder uh, as, as many young leaders face challenging uh, everyday life. You know, and, and, and often as a leader, you stand up quite lonely. So, you know, getting this thing of standing shoulder to shoulder and cheering for one another, having mentors speaking into our lives, cheering for us. Uh, so we've met up annually since 2016. So if you have been to any one of those three gatherings, do give up a thump. Great. I think there are much more, many more times coming here. And uh, for those of you who haven't been there, you're welcome, very, very extra, 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 very, very welcome to be here tonight. <laughs> you're here for a reason. You know, sometimes you feel like, oh, I'm new here. Like, where, where do I belong here? You do. Somebody saw that you have a, uh, are an important leader in, in the kingdom of God and wanted you to be here tonight. So you're very welcome. Um, then Evi, is also technical so she has prepared some sliders for us uh, so we'll be she will now give you a link um, and then you can either just uh, bring up your phone and uh, use the, the thing there uh, whatever that's called and uh, just put it in on the screen and you'll get in there and then or you can just go for slido.com and and put the number um, so i'll do that and then the first question for you, you'll have to fill in. We were wondering if you should do a poll, but just you can just fill in. So the first question is, where are you from, basically? Uh, yeah, great. Bring it on. <laughs> you know, I'm so excited to see that there are quite a number of people who are actually missionaries. Uh, coming from other continents to Europe to, to bless us. Thank you so much. There's someone from Czech Republic. That's great. I love that. Wow. Fantastic. Great job. Who's here from Poland? You might unmute yourself and then, hi, I'm from Poland. <laughs> hey, this is uh, Paulina and Monica from Poland. Great, you're very welcome. I think, that, you know, there are several Brazilians here. Who's here from Brazil? You know, living in Europe as missionaries. Yay! <laughs> Hi, so oi, Sara. <laughs> Yay. Sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. 
And there's someone I think that could be Janet, who's from Iceland, France, or England. That's a pretty international person. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, I think we all got a quite good uh, understanding of who's here. So let's go for the next question, Evie. So what are some of the challenges you are facing in this COVID-19 times? Uh, what are the challenges? And then I think as, as you're reading this now, just feel free to pray for one another. Yeah, mental health, I think it's staying quite alone and with a lot of worries, it's finances, loneliness, feeling apathy, giving up, depression. Thank you for honesty, for your honesty, guys. Yeah, pressure, hard to hope, relationships. Yeah, for me, it's an actually an awesome time. Mm -hmm. Hard to get in touch with young people. Difficult to keep motivated. And guys, like as as we read, thank you for your honesty. And as we read this, just keep praying. I think it's such a great thing, and we'll 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 be able to share it more personally in the groups later on. But I think it's it's a key of the YLG is to be honest with life, um, and and also to be honest with it that we have an awesome God we can bring all these things to. Mm -hmm. Distance between people, love and cheerful spirit, lack of hugs. I I reckon that one. I love hugs. Okay, good. Thanks, guys, for, for being honest. Um, then we'll move um, we'll move to the next one, which is which is uh, where do you see opportunities right now? Because with an awesome God, there is always opportunities. Also, when there are challenges. So, where do you see an opportunity right now? Yeah, reaching people through the internet. I've heard beautiful stories about that. Yeah, bringing hope where there's hopelessness. Yeah, people are needy and we have hope. Phone calls, sending cards. God loves people, my family. Answering real needs. Yeah, people are giving high value to fellowship. Studying the word of God. <clears throat> Social media evangelism. And guys, as we are reading this, um, take it to you, like, you know, feel the enthusiasm and see the opportunities. And also pray as we're read, reading this as well. Pray for those who are seeing those opportunities that they will be able to, to walk straight into it and engage what, what God is doing. Connecting with you all, likewise. Yeah, life slowed down. Time to think. People are seeking. Beautiful. Okay, guys. We'll bring all of this, th these things with us into the prayers later on. Um, yeah, a few more came around. Fantastic. You know, there is uh, just before we, we, we hand over to Dave, I would I've just been reflecting today and, and thinking about one of the things I would say about Europe, our continent today, is is that I would compare it to the to the prodigal son um, who left God, left his father, left God, and didn't trust in his father anymore, uh, ran off. And and when I when I look at Europe, I feel it's like it, it's as if Europe is coming to itself and realized we have messed up. 
the issue being they don't not knowing the way home to the father. They have like it's all it's like the, the whole continent somehow forgot the way back to the father. Uh, it, the continent is coming to itself, but it forget the, has forgotten the way back. So as as the Church of Europe, I, I think it's just such a key to just you know. We need to help our continent to find a way because it's there, it's already there, and and help people to discover that it's possible to come back. Um, so with those words, I would just like to pray, and then um, we'll dive into the, the first part part of the teaching. So Father, we we thank you that you are here, that you are present. Thank you that you never give up. Thank you that you are you are standing there at the gate, waiting for each person in our continent to come home. You're waiting for our continent to come home, for our, our continent to once again put our trust in you and not in ourselves. And we pray, Father, would you equip us as your body in, in Europe? Would you challenge us? Would you lead us forward? Would you lift our burdens and our pain and our struggles off our shoulders? And would you help us? Would you turn our eyes up to you and out to the big harvest that's, that's around us? And would you help us to show Europe that there is a way back home, that the Father is waiting. We commit these two hours into your hands. Come and do your work in us, in between us. Speak to us and encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we have, uh, we have two great speakers with us today, and I'm really looking forward to, to listen to you guys. Um, Dave, Patty, are, are you here? I'm here. Yeah, That's right. I see you. Fantastic. Very, very welcome. Um, Dave, you have, uh, you have to correct me now if, if I'm doing any mistakes here, but you're okay. married to Connie and you have three adult children. That's right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> you're you're American and you have lived in Czech for uh, all. And uh, you're a teacher and you're a mission leader and uh, you've founded Josiah Ventures and you're leading it today. Uh, Josiah Ventures being a mission organization based or I think more or less at least um, the eastern part of, of Europe and the central part of Europe um, and doing a lot of great job. And, and I've lived for five years in the Czech Republic and I've learned and seen so many beautiful fruits of your ministry and your life. Mm -hmm. And and really it's it's been amazing to see what, what God has used you and your family to, to do in, in the Czech Republic and, and beyond. So we're really excited to, to, to hear from you and uh, yeah, you're welcome. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Christian. And I was so looking forward to being with most of you personally and physically in Poland. So it's great to see you on the, the screen, but I, I wish that uh, we were physically present and that we could be having coffee. Uh, I've been working in Europe for the past 37 years, 27 years in Czech, and then 10 years before that in Germany. And the entire time, my focus has been younger leaders, how to equip the next generation to reach the next generation. So I just... I just love this group, the fact that you're younger leaders, and then some of your older ones kind of hanging on, you know, cheering everyone else on. Uh, but uh, it's just amazing what uh, young, gifted, spirit-empowered leaders can do to change nations and even change continents as we point people's attention back to Christ. So I wish I wish we were physically together. And, and these are really unusual times, especially for leaders. Uh, leaders like to lead. Leaders like to accomplish things. And how many events have you had canceled in these last months? And how many plans have you had to change? How many things do you wish you could do that you can't? Uh, it's hard for leaders to lead when it seems like there's nowhere to go or there's only a very few open doors. And to, today we're going to talk about leadership behind the curtain because while there is leadership activity that's kind of on stage where we, we get to do things that are seen and make a difference, we often don't realize that leadership behind the curtain is sometimes even more important, the unseen habits of leadership that prepare the way for the future. 
And actually this time is, is, has a particular opportunity, gives us a particular opportunity to develop the habits of leadership behind the curtain. So that's why we're talking about that tonight. And we're going to look at Nehemiah who uh, accomplished uh, amazing things. In 52 days, he rebuilt the wall, a wall that had been broken for several generations. Uh, people thought it couldn't be done and he accomplished it in 52 days. But we're going to look at what happened before he started doing anything publicly, before anyone could see what was happening behind the curtain that actually prepared the way for Nehemiah to accomplish those amazing things. I hope you have your Bibles. I love the Word of God. I love the way the Spirit speaks to us through His Word. And so if you have that open in front of you, this, this will just even be so much better. So I hope you can open God's Word to Nehemiah chapter 1 as we look at these, these uh, four habits of leadership behind the curtain. So we'll start just with the first verse, the words of Nehemiah, the son of ha -ha Hakaliah. Now it happened in the months of, months of, months of Chislev in the 12th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had all survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. And we find out later on that Nehemiah is a cupbearer, which is, is more than just a, a, a really gifted waiter. Uh, a cupbearer worked directly in the presence of the king and was one of their most trusted advisors. So Nehemiah had achieved a high rank in a foreign government and was obviously a very busy man. The responsibilities that he had consumed him and what was going on in Jerusalem was really outside of that scope of responsibility. But you find a leader, a busy leader with lots of responsibilities, being curious about things outside the circle of their primary responsibility. And actually, this is one of the habits of leadership behind the curtain is inquiry about things that are outside your responsibility. Uh, Nehemiah was curious about what was going on in people who were farther away and was concerned about needs that, that really were beyond his job description. And leaders who make a difference are, are curious leaders. They, they look across the borders of their responsibilities. They ask about what's going on in other places. They're sensitive to needs and they're not just overwhelmed by their circle of responsibilities. They inquire, they look, they look beyond. I remember a certain time when God started stirring my heart in the Czech Republic for things beyond the borders of our work. Uh, we were training youth leaders and helping youth ministries in local churches. But every time I was on the train or I'd walk through cities, I would see thousands of young people. And I kept thinking, how are we going to reach the young people who have no contact with a Christian, who have no contact with the church? Because Czech Republic is one of the most atheist countries on earth. And many, many non-Christians don't even know a Christian. How will we get the message to them? And that was a little outside of my circle of responsibilities, but I started really being concerned about it. And I went to our team and I said, let's just start praying a bold uh, prayer. Uh, let's, let's pray that God gives us the opportunity not just to share the gospel with hundreds, not just with thousands, but with millions of people. Now, I chose the number million because it has so many numbers on it, I can't even imagine. how I wasn't thinking literally when I chose that number million. It's just way more than we can imagine. And so we started praying that way. Now, how could God accomplish that? We didn't know. Uh, how, how could we reach those people outside of our responsibility? That, we didn't know, but this is leadership that's behind the curtain. This is uh, leaders who are becoming curious and noticing needs beyond their area of responsibilities. And that's started what, what we started doing as, as a team. Uh, a couple months later, after we were praying like this, uh, we had a graduation of some interns who were in one of our intern programs. And I sat across the table from one of the parents, one of the fathers. And I asked him, what do you do? And he said, well, I produce TV programs for Czech television. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. I said, what, what do you want to do farther down the road? He said, well, I wish I could use my gifts to build God's kingdom. And so I said to him, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was a TV show for young people 
young people, now that was back when young people were watching TV and not watching the internet. That was before all that came. But uh, I said, that's, that's a place where you could get in all kinds of homes and reach young people. Wouldn't that be amazing? And he just stopped and he said, are you serious, Dave? And I said, well, I'm, I'm serious. It'd be a great idea if, if we could somehow do it. And he said, you know, that would be worth giving my next years to. He said, if God opened the door to this, would you, would you do it with me? And I said, well, I, I don't know. Maybe I've never done anything in TV before. He says, well, listen, if you pray about it, I'll pray about it. Will you promise me that you'll start praying about it? And I said, okay. Now, that was a, an interesting conversation, a, a conversation beyond the borders of our responsibilities, uh, curiosity about what he would do and what God might do that actually led to the second habit that we see with, uh, with Nehemiah. He says, as soon as he heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. Now, leadership behind the curtain also lets our hearts be stirred, stirred uh, about things that that seem way beyond us. And he said, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ears be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your sins, your, your, your servants. And he says, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. And so you see Nehemiah actually including himself in a problem that wasn't his. Uh, were those his sins? He wasn't even living in that town, but he makes himself a part of that issue, and he's burdened by it, and he takes that need to God, and it's a need that he's weeping about, and he's fasting, and he's praying. And I think we underestimate uh, the leadership work that takes uh, that, that takes place when we weep and fast and pray before God. When we allow our hearts to be stirred by needs uh, that, that are, uh, uh, and, and that are outcomes that are beyond our ability to accomplish. Turning the nation of Israel back to God, fixing the walls around the city, that's, he's a cupbearer to the king. He's not going to be able to do anything about that. But he allows his heart to be burdened, and he spends time and energy in prayer before God for these needs. He says, uh, remember the words that you commanded your servant Moses uh, saying, and he goes on and he, he actually reminds God of his promises. So he, he lets himself be burdened by the needs in prayer. He weeps, he includes himself in the problem and confesses his sins along with the sins of the people. And then he reminds God of his promises. So in prayer, we also need to remind God of his promises. Re remember for ourselves the promises of God that he can do things way beyond what we can. Often we only ask God for what we can picture how he would accomplish. But God has possibilities way beyond our ability. And uh, what, what we have here is the second habit, and this is the habit of prayer, uh, interceding for outcomes that are beyond our abilities. Interceding for outcomes that are beyond our ability. So inquiry, you're curious about needs that are beyond your responsibility. And with prayer, you're interceding for outcomes that are beyond your ability. Outcomes that are beyond your ability. So I started praying with my new friend who produced TV shows, and I didn't know him very well. We started praying that God would open a door to allow us to share the gospel on Czech TV to young people. That's impossible. That's totally impossible. Except about two months later, he gave me a call and he said, uh, I've arranged a meeting with the head of religious broadcasting for Czech television. Uh, would you meet with them? I said, well, oh, okay. And uh, we, we sat together and uh, he came and, and uh, talked for a while. And he said, uh, he, he, he said uh, what are you interested in? We said, well, letting young people hear about God. And he said, well, there are a couple of different formats. And then he explained to us something very interesting. And this is where sovereign God works. He says the, um, the government had just come to this te television station, which belonged to the government. And they were concerned about the moral slide among young people. And they said uh, the religious broadcasting division typically just kind of put a camera in the back of a mass in a Catholic service or, or reported on some religious uh, visitor that was visiting. But he said they came to him and asked, could you do a, a Christian show for young people? 
and the television station didn't have any, any experience with it. This happened at the same time as he was stirring our hearts. He said, would you be interested in cooperating with us and doing a Christian show for young people? And we said, well, oh, well but maybe. And, and uh, he, he, he said, well, which kind of format would you like? I said, well, what are the possibilities? And he said, well, there's a 15 minute format and a 20 minute format and a 30 minute format. He said, I would recommend the 20 minute format and the entire time I'm thinking one time we're going to possibly broadcast one show. And he said, and uh, we would we would like you to go for seven uh, for actually at that time he said for 14 weeks, we'd like you to go for three and a half months broadcasting every week. Well, this was just just uh, wild. And uh, he said, uh, he said, why don't you why don't you put together a uh, proposal and uh, put together a pilot for this. Now, one of the things you need to know is that um, I don't even watch very much TV. Um, I uh, don't have much time for it. I studied theology and, um, and uh, pedagogy. I didn't study media production. And all of a sudden, this friend of mine was saying, Dave, could you be the executive producer of this TV show with all of my great TV production experience? Of course, they were going to put it together. And we had to, we had to put together a pilot. Now, this is, this is crazy. This is the time where you say no, right? Where you say I'm, I'm beyond my abilities. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting about Nehemiah, Nehemiah had never built a wall before. He was a cupbearer to the king. Uh, he didn't even live in Jerusalem. He was very unqualified for this task. But you find something interesting in chapter two. In the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now this, he knows how to do. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? Now this is interesting. Very quickly in a conversation, the king is asking him for a specific plan. So Nehemiah is saying, my heart's burdened. And the king says, what are you requesting? What would have happened if Nehemiah would have said, uh, don't know, haven't thought much about it. Give me a couple months and I'll come up with a plan. What would have happened in that kind of situation? But look at what he says. He says, if he pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, then send me to Judah to the city of my father's graves that I may rebuild it, rebuild it. And the king says, how long will you be gone? Where do you return? Nehemiah doesn't have time to think this up right now. And he says, and he, and he says, how long you'll be gone? He says he needs letters. He says what supplies he's going to need. And what you find is that Nehemiah has a plan and he has a plan. Now you don't, the, the, the text doesn't say this, but he must have spent some of that time in those months taking trips to the future and picturing how this actually could become a reality, even though he didn't have the resources to make it happen. And here's the, the third habit. Remember the, the first habit is inquiry, uh, being curious about things that are beyond the area of your responsibility. The second one is prayer, interceding for things that are beyond your ability. And this third one is field trips to the future. Uh, sometimes we have to actually kind of visit the future, go, go a year forward, go several months forward, and picture if God were to answer this, what would it look like? And actually come to put together plans that we have no possibility of accomplishing. So Nehemiah um, could not have done this without these letters. He couldn't have done this without being released. There were all kinds of reasons that could have stopped him. But he skipped all those reasons and went to the future. And one of the things about powerful leaders is they, they take field trips to the future. And then from a future reality, they find their way back. So they, he just said, okay, the, the wall is rebuilt. Now let me backwards figure out how that happened. And came up with these plans that, well, I would have needed a letter. And I would have needed to get released. And it would have taken about this much time. Uh, sometimes we try to project the the present into the future, and we don't get very far. We think, uh, oh, I've got a team of 10. What could I accomplish with a team of 10? Or I have four hours free a week. What could I do with that? Or 
I have just a little bit of money. What could I do? And we, we take our current resources and project out into the future. Instead of just skipping all of that and taking a field trip, just going to the completed reality, picturing what God might want to do, and then working our way back and describing things that we could never accomplish, which is, which, is what, um, which is what Nehemiah did in this situation. I remember when that, um, that director of religious broadcasting from Czech television walked out of the room, um, I looked at... Um, I looked at my friend Lubosch and I said, how in the world would we accomplish this? And I started thinking through our team and I realized we didn't have the team that could do this. I started thinking through our finances and I realized we didn't have the finances that could do this. I realized we didn't have the experience that we could do it. But together with Lubosch, we just took a trip to the future and said, what would it take? And we said, we would need this kind of person, this kind of person, this kind of person. We would need to do a pilot. Uh, we would need this and this and this. And we begin to outline things that we had no idea how they would be accomplished. We began making a budget for money that we didn't have. Uh, we began planning for time that wasn't available. Uh, we began uh, planning for, for these episodes, these, these 14 episodes that, um, that, hadn't been, that hadn't even been approved yet. And actually leaders do this. They make plans in faith uh, because what happens is the opportunities come so fast that if you can't see the future, you won't be able to step into it. If uh, Nehemiah wasn't ready, he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been able to he wouldn't have been able to move. And what we found was actually we found that someone who had trusted Christ at one of our camps several years before was actually a, a television star. He was working in an MTV kind of. Uh, uh, of, of production. We went to him, he said, would you be willing to host the show? And he said, yes, I would. And, and someone else who'd been through a lot of our youth leader training, we realized that he was a writer and his father used to write movie scripts. And we went to him and asked, would you be interested in writing the text, the scripts for us? He said, yes. All of a sudden we realized that God had people prepared that we didn't even know about. And once we started describing what we needed and asking God for it, then the doors begin to open. Well, we uh, produced a, a pilot for Czech television and they sent back and they said, this is great. Why don't you go ahead and produce it? They said, oh, by the way, we'll air it for free, but you need to pay for the production. And we got out our calculators and started figuring this out and realized that it was going to cost us uh, at least $14,000 per episode, maybe up to 20,000. And we looked in our bank accounts and went, this is, this is just, uh, we just don't have the resources for this. this. There's no way that this could happen. Now, God often leads us to places that we have no resources for. We don't have the people resources for them. We don't have the financial resources. And leaders have to, behind the curtain, believe God for things that they can't imagine how they could appear. Just ask him for it. God, if you want to do this, that somehow you have solutions for this that we couldn't imagine. And somewhere during this time, uh, I got a phone call from, from someone in a, in a very fuzzy line. I, I picked up the phone and, and I could hear the shh, all this buzz on the line. And, and a voice said, this is Orist. And I said, Orist. He said, someone has given, you my, given me your name and wants me to visit you. I said, Orist, where are you from? I'm, I'm calling you from Kiev, the Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine. Okay, some Orist from... Kiev is going to visit me. Okay, that's going to be interesting. He says, my wife and I are coming. Would you pick us up? We want to learn about your ministry. Okay, I picked him up. Didn't know who he was. And as we start talking, I find out that Orist, who lives in, the Ukraine, in Ukraine, actually is working for a large foundation that, um, that you actually can't get to. They only find you. They don't have a front door, only a back door. And that someone had told him that he needed to get in contact with us. He wouldn't even tell us really who he was working for. It was one of those kind of, he said, he said, our, our donors don't like anyone to know uh, how we're giving. So, okay, that's really interesting. And I showed him our ministry and, and our work that we were doing. And, and he was kind of interested in some of it. And then he said, anything else? And I said, well, there's this wild idea. We don't even know if it's going to happen. But we've got this opportunity to maybe... Uh, broadcast with Czech television, but it's going to be very expensive. And his eyes perked up and he said, really? He says, our foundation is particularly interested in media evangelism. 
that's the thing actually we've been looking for. He said, uh, what would this cost? And so I got out my calculator and I said, actually, this is crazy, but we're going to need a half a million dollars to do this. And that's a lot of money. That's, uh, that's more money than in, any of you make in a couple of months. You know, that's hard to think. That's also a lot of zeros. And I was just, I was embarrassed even to tell him the amount of money that I was, that I was thinking about this. And he said, how soon would you need to know? I said, really to say yes to check television, we have to know within a week. And he says, normally our process takes several months, but let me see what I can do. One week later, he got back. He said, our board was able to meet specially and we can't do a half a million dollars, but we can do $350,000. Would that help you get started? I went, well, I think that would help a lot. I think that would be just, Wow, Orist from Kiev calling us up. Uh, wow, how does that happen? And this is actually happening to Nehemiah that as he's stepping forward in response to these needs, uh, he, he's stepping into things he has no idea how are going to be accomplished. But he, he makes plans and asks God and he's ready. And often what happens is if we don't get ready, we're never able to say to the person who we're never able to say, I need these kinds of people and let God provide them, or I need these kinds of resources. And maybe God would have on somebody's minds and hearts to step in and answer that. So um, he, the king says, yes, he, he has like just a few minutes to tell his list, but his list is prepared. So your, your list of what you're asking God for needs to be prepared because you took field trips to the future. And then he goes uh, to visit Jerusalem, and you'll see in verse 9, he says, um, he does all these things, and look in verse 11, he says, he gets to Jerusalem, and he was there three days. Then I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one on which I rode. I went out by night, and then he goes out, and he talks about inspecting the walls by night. So he'd gotten a lot of information. He had a lot of plans, but he still walked the walls. And one of the things that leaders do who lead behind the curtain is, is uh, they make plans and they have assumptions, but they check them out in the real world. They quietly go out and walk the walls and check out to see if things are really as they, as they think they are. Uh, because sometimes we miss it. You know, what's the situation of these walls? We have to kind of get out of our offices and, and, and get out of our meetings and, and walk the places that we want to see God work and, and say, uh, what, what am I feeling? What am I seeing? And we did this first pilot. Oh, we had some great ideas with this, with this pilot. But before we went any further, we got groups of young people together and we showed it to them. And, you know, they liked parts of it and they didn't like other parts of it. And there were a lot of things that we had to change. We had to re real world test our assumptions. If we hadn't walked the walls, we could have done 14 episodes and some of them would have really been wrong. And then uh, we also talked to other people about it. And I remember I was talking to one of my friends as I was walking the walls with this idea. And he said, you know, it really, it's not as important what happens on the TV, but it's the conversation that happens afterwards. He says, how do you get Christians having conversations with their non-Christian friends that are stirred by this TV show? And we realized that we had to launch an entirely separate campaign to equip the local church to use this TV show to reach young, young people. And then that became a whole another, another thing where we actually uh, saw over a thousand small groups start of people who were meeting together with their friends, uh, watching this TV show, and then having discussions with them about God. Well, that, that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gotten out and walked the walls. So in our case, uh, in the fall, the, the show started broadcasting and we went, oh, how will this, how will this happen? And first week, 150,000 people were watching it. Next week, 180,000 people, then 200,000. And you need to remember in the country that I live in, there's about 40 to 50,000 evangelical believers. So we were doing a weekly outreach twice a week that was reaching three times the entire evangelical population of, of the country. country. Uh, about, a, about a thousand uh, people were, uh, we had these, all these small groups that were starting, thousands of small groups. 
And uh, partway in, we got about seven episodes in and Czech television came back to us and said, we're really surprised at this uh, response from this. Can you keep going? Can you do another 10? And so then we did another 10 and they said, why don't you finish out the year? And we did actually, um, we did actually 40 episodes that year broadcasting twice a week on national TV. And then to the end of that, they said, this has gone so well, take a year's break and we want you to do it again. And we came back in an entire another year of broadcasting twice a week on national TV, paid for by the Czech government. We had to pay for, we had to do a lot of other fundraising for the production, but ended up broadcasting 82 weeks on national TV, testimonies every week of lives that have been changed by Christ. And I don't even watch TV. So I ended up being the executive producer of a TV program with no training and no background. And Nehemiah built a wall and he was a cupbearer to a king. And just one of the things I want to say is God can do amazing things through you, things that would surprise you if you learn leadership behind the curtain, if, if you learn to care about things that are beyond your borders, your responsibility, if you learn to pray for, for things that you, you couldn't imagine accomplish. If you learn to plan for, make plans that you, you can't realize without help. And, uh, and if you walk the walls and make sure that you're always checking out your assumptions in the real world, uh, God can accomplish really some amazing and surprising things. It, it was pretty crazy at the end of that time, after two years of broadcasting, uh, we tallied up all the number of people that had watched it. And we realized that there had been over 8 million viewings of this TV show in a country of 10 and a half million. And probably over a million people had seen it. Uh, probably about 10% of the population had seen it. And remember our prayer, the crazy prayer with too many zeros, you know, like God give us the opportunity to not just reach hundreds, not reach thousands, but to reach uh, millions with your gospel. And actually exit 316 sparked tours through local high schools. It, it, um, it sparked, uh, there's actually been a TV, sh a Christian TV show on TV, TV every season since then. There's one that started airing this Sunday because it opened a block that Czech television has kept open for Christian broadcasts. And the ripple of the uh, effect of, the, uh, of that small little step of faith has just been astounding. Now, we didn't know that at the beginning. So I'm just telling you that as, as an encouragement that leadership behind the curtain can sometimes have much greater impact than you can imagine. And I've used up my time and more. I'm sorry you got me telling stories. So I'll end. <laughs> so I'll, I'll hand things back, Chris, and to you. Thank you so much, Dave. You know, I've been sitting in, in Ostrava in Czech Republic, uh, leading one of those Tosin groups. Oh, See, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've <laughs> wow. seen young teen Czech teenagers coming to faith, watching it and, and growing in discipleship. So thank you for, for, uh, for walking in faith and, and going for it. Um, wonderful. Um, Dave, have you prepared two questions for us? It was called Exit 316, the TV yeah. show. Yeah. It was. I have prepared two questions. I'm going to let you go now because I took too much time for you. No, fantastic. Could you, could you share the two questions with us? And Evie will write it down. Here's the first that. question. Yeah. Um, what, what inspires you from either the stories that I told or from Yemai's example? And then the second is, of those four habits, which one do you need to work on right now? Remember what they are? The habit of inquiry, curiosity, the habit of prayer, the habit of taking field trips to the future, and, uh, and the habit of walking the walls, checking out your assumptions in the real world. It happens in the unseen, happens behind the curtain. Which of those four do you need to particularly focus on right now? And so you can discuss those two questions in your small group. Thank you. Thank you. So then Evie has written it uh, in, the, in the chat, so you can find the questions there. And then Janet will uh, divide us into the groups. Okay. Um, Great. I hope you had good conversations. We are, we are moving back into those groups in a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, But before we do that, we have another speaker who will inspire us. Uh, Jim Memory, are you here? I am. Good Fantastic. It's Evening. great to have you here. Um, so, yeah, something just happened, but yeah. <laughs> so, Jim... Uh, married to Christine and you also have three uh, grown-up children. 
So I assume that if you want to be part of, of speaking to the YLGs, you have to you have to be you have to have three grown up, grown up children first. Um, Jim, you're you're from Britain, uh, but you live in Spain, and you've That's been right. doing, yeah you've been doing church planting there, and you're also lecturing uh, on European mission at uh, Redcliffe Redcliffe College, and you're also a member of the international leadership of uh, the European Christian Mission. And, uh, and as well, you are leading, I, I guess so, some of you heard about the impact groups, which is running in, in um, the Lausanne movement in Europe at the moment. If you haven't heard about it, you will hear a little bit more in the end. And it's a really exciting thing going on. And Jim is leading the team who is preparing all the materials for it really faithfully. And, and uh, I've gotten to know you through that. And it's been a real blessing to, to get to know you and, and, uh, and serve together with you and under you. So we're excited to, to have you here and uh, we're excited to listening uh, a little bit of the state of Europe, what's, what's going on. Um, so here we go. Fantastic, okay. Well, I've sent Evie uh, a presentation. I don't need it, but um, if you'd like to have that running alongside what I'm saying, um, that might be uh, useful to some people. So um, she's gonna send that on the chat, I believe. Um, it's been uh, great to see your faces and frankly, um, I was also like Dave, really looking forward to being with you guys. Um, the last YLG event that I was at two years ago in Budapest was such a personal blessing to me. Um, the, the connect group, um, just, uh, well connected, I think is the only way to put it really. And um, we carried on meeting after Budapest for the best part of the next year, every month, and then uh, met up again recently uh, on a one-off. So um, it's been very special uh, for me. That, that occasion was a real blessing. Um, but I have to admit a certain um, degree of discomfort with the title that I've been given for today. <laughs> Um, of course, I could have changed it, but I decided rather than do that, I would I would um, surf on the title and use it as a learning point. Um, the issue, of course, I have is with the word trends. Now, a trend line is something that's drawn on a chart to connect two or more data points to indicate a direction of travel. And we often think that we can extrapolate out from uh, existing data points uh, and imagine the future, hence the title Trends in Europe and how we should respond. But the problem is, uh, history teaches us that the really significant moments, the changes that truly change the world, can't be predicted by any trend line. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this book. It's called Black Swan. Before the discovery of Australia, Europeans were convinced that all swans were white. There were thousands of data points to support that idea. All their previous travels around the world had confirmed that idea until they discovered the first black swan. Of course, initially they said, well, it can't be a swan. It must be some other sort of bird. But eventually they checked it out and it was a swan that was black. No trend line could possibly have predicted the existence of a black swan. And uh, Nicholas Taleb's book is really all about the unexpected and unpredictable events that have had an extraordinary impact on our world. If you think about it, even if you've forgotten most of your history classes at school, there are certain years which are burned into our memories as Europeans. 1914, the start of the Great War, 1945, World War II, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 2001, Twin Towers, 2008, the economic crisis, and now the year that we are living in, 2020. This is a year that your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews will ask you about one day. Now, you can argue about whether a global pandemic was inevitable or in some ways predictable, but this year is a black swan. It is not just a gentle bend in the trend lines of what's happening 
in the world and in Europe. It is a completely new trend line or even a jump onto a different line altogether. Of course, it might be a black swan to us, but it's no black swan to God. COVID was no surprise to him. There is no black swan for a sovereign God. We are, as Dave's reminded us, on a field trip to the future, but we are on one that we are not gonna come back from. This is no field trip that we come back with our suitcases and tell our mum and dad how it's gone. This is a trip we're on and we don't know where God's gonna take us. Now, two years ago, when I presented at the YLG in Budapest, I presented a, a presentation under the title of uh, Crises in Europe, and I suggested that it's helpful to look at Europe through six lenses to get an idea of what's going on. We need to look at, at Europe through a political lens, an economic lens, a social lens, an environmental lens, a technological lens, and a spiritual lens. And of course, that is still the case. There's huge value in doing that, even in your local situation, thinking about the practical and particular challenges and opportunities for the gospel in your situation viewed through those lenses. But I think COVID has disrupted things so much and accelerated change processes so much that we're actually facing quite new phenomena in some places. So I'm going to go through each of those again, highlighting a single issue and then saying something about how COVID has impacted it and how we might respond, okay? So in some ways it might sound, well, he just did that presentation two years ago. Why is he doing that? So it's not the same presentation at all, okay? They're lenses that we're looking through again. Uh, you remember Dave's frame? Well, this is a bit like that too, where we're looking at the frame of life through these different lenses. In the political sphere, the trend that I highlighted back in 2018 was popular nationalism. Europe has a long history of problems with nationalism. In fact, in many ways, you could say the European Union was and is an attempt at restraining the ambitions of single, single nations as a way of avoiding the conflicts of the past. But nationalism is still there, bubbling under the surface in almost every European country. And within the recognized nation states, often there are autonomous or semi-autonomous regions which aspire to be nations in their own right. Now, the idea of a nation is a very powerful one because it gives people a shared, a sense of shared identity. Not a bad thing in itself, but all too often it defines who we are against others who we are not. And that plays out in all sorts of ways, whether in Brexit, Catalan independence conversations, Russian pretensions in the Ukraine, the current standoff between Poland and Hungary and the rest of the EU over the budget, read about that today in the newspaper, even the way different countries and regions have handled COVID. In Spain, where I live, COVID has provided yet more reasons for autonomous regions to set themselves against each other and in particular against the government in Madrid. And many governments have brought in loads of powers under the guise of controlling the pandemic, increasing security measures, surveillance, curtailing liberties that previous generations have fought hard to win. So two comments in the way of response to that reality. First of all, that as Christians, we need to remember that the Christian gospel cuts right across nationalism because our primary identity is not in the nation, but in Christ. As national and regional identities become ever more used as identity markers for belonging, the church of today and tomorrow needs to recover its prophetic voice that it had during the mid 20th century to challenge the false hope that popular nationalism is putting as a other gospel in some cases across Europe. Secondly, many of you will have grown up thinking that the Schengen area of border free travel has and would always be there. It is very likely that we will never return 
to the same levels of freedom of movement that existed before the start of this year. International travel is likely to become ever more expensive and more burdensome. We're going to have to have tests when we cross borders, um, departure and arrival at airports with all of the impact that that's going to have on Christian mission, short-term trips, long-term cross-cultural mission mobilization, and so on. The implications of this are huge. That in the way of the national uh, perspective, sorry, the national uh, issue. Let's talk now a minute about the economic lens. If the key word when we look at Europe through the political lens is nationalism, the key word here is debt. As I'm sure all of you know, GDP, gross domestic product, is how economists measure the general health of an economy. It's a bit like your blood pressure. You don't want it to be too high or too low, and certainly not going up and down rapidly. Over the past 15 years, there have been three significant dips in gross domestic product. The first corresponded to the global uh, financial crisis in 2008, when the European economy contracted by between five and six percent. The second was the sovereign debt crisis, when the governments of Greece and Cyprus, Spain, Portugal and Italy had to go cap in hand to the European Central Bank for a bailout. That was around about a 2% contraction. COVID, though, in the spring of this year caused a 12% contraction in GDP, twice as deep as the 2008 recession. It recovered somewhat over the summer, but the second wave and the bringing in of further control measures, we're looking at a global recession and certainly a recession in Europe stretching well into 2021 and possibly beyond. But it's actually even worse than that because the, 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 the last few years of relative stability have only been possible because the European Central Bank has been pumping in huge amounts of money into the economy to keep it going. If we return to the blood pressure analogy, we've been having a regular blood transfusion every month. Now, the last few years, as I say, might have seemed stable, but that was only possible because the ECB was pumping in sometimes 30, sometimes 60, and at some points, 90 billion euro every month just to keep our economic blood pressure up. That is 100, 200 euros a month for every single Eurozone citizen. You don't need to be an economist to know. If you borrow 100 euros a month for every member of your family just to keep putting food on the table, something isn't quite right. And then COVID happened. Governments have had to borrow even more money just to try and preserve jobs and livelihoods. And I don't need to tell you guys how much of an impact that's already had on young people. Some sectors of employment have already almost completely disappeared. Hospitality, tourism, the airline industry, commerce have already seen huge layoffs. Unemployment may be an actual issue for some of you and possibly a future one. What should be our response then in this situation? Well, firstly, I think we do need to adjust to this new reality. We do need to adjust to the expectations um, both as individuals and as countries. We can't just keep, forgive me for putting it in these terms, we can't keep borrowing from our unborn children and ne nephews and nieces to finance our lifestyles today. Jesus called us to a simple lifestyle. We also need to remember that the ones who are most affected by COVID are the most vulnerable. Its impact on mental health, its impact in, in, in numbers of food banks that have popped up on the elderly. And yes, there may be possibilities for us to consider creation of employment as a, as a frontier for mission in the future. But this, this area of the economic challenges is something that we all need to be thinking about, not just for ourselves, but those around us as well. In the social area, there are two huge demographic trends. I did mention them last time, but again, I want to relate them to COVID. The first of those is migration. Over the last 50 years, there's been a massive reversal in the flows of migration. Europe 
used to be somewhere people migrated from. Now it's somewhere people migrate to. We receive around about a million migrants a year across the EU. But every corner of Europe is different. Some countries, of course, like France, Germany, and the UK have seen their uh, populations grow very much through this time. Others, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, have suffered very significant emigration. The 10 countries with the fastest shrinking populations in the world are all in Europe. Bulgaria, Lithuania, Latvia, Moldova, Ukraine, Croatia, Romania, Serbia, Poland, and Hungary. All of that, those countries have lost more than 10% of their population over the last 25 years. And migration is one reason for collapsing populations, but the other is our reluctance to have children as Europeans. Across Europe, not a single European state has a birth rate sufficient to maintain its population. And in some countries, the numbers are frighteningly low. We're having fewer children, and when we have them, we have them later in life. And that in turn drives migration as we need migrants to work and pay our pensions. What are gonna be the effects of COVID on those two trends then? Well, in the short term, COVID may slow regular migration because of the travel restrictions. But that hasn't stopped the 17,000 people who have arrived in the Canary Islands since the summer on small boats. The migration routes across the Mediterranean that used to take people into Lampedusa and into Greece are increasingly bringing people to Spain. And as for birth rate, the uncertainty around the future is likely to only suppress the birth rates of Europe further. Now, migration is one of the ways that God is growing his church in Europe, and we should do whatever we can to welcome the migrants in our midst. When it comes to Christian migrants, go the extra mile, because some of them are God's missionaries to Europe. When it comes to children, though, the response is, still, is simple. We are a people of hope, and people of hope make families. So, as I said two years ago, uh, in inverted commas, mission is about making babies too. The church grows through biograph biological growth, not just through people becoming Christians. Fourthly, the environmental lens. Now, we're not talking much about global warming these days, but 18 of the 19 warmest years on record have been since the turn of the millennium. Many European countries have had severe heat waves in recent years, but extreme weather is not only limited to heat waves. Flooding and droughts have also become a regular problem across Europe. And then there is COVID. The connection between the emergence of new diseases like COVID and climate change and biodiversity is increasingly recognized. COVID is a wake up call for broader environmental threats. And the thing about environmental factors is that they affect everyone. And that's certainly the case with COVID. COVID has affected everyone and everything. So the key word in this area is everything. God's kingdom is about everything. But God's purpose in Christ is to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, Colossians 1.20. So whatever your job, Whatever your career, whatever your situation, God wants to bring his kingdom there. And I think COVID is showing us again just how much life is interconnected, that mission involves everything. There is no sacred secular divide. You are an ambassador for the kingdom of reconciliation. So whatever you do, do it as for Christ himself. The technological lens. And two years ago, I talked briefly about some of the technological megatrends, the new technologies that are anticipated to be just around the corner. Many of those are already taking place, but what COVID has done has been to accelerate those developments, perhaps even more to accelerate the adoption of existing digital technologies by most, if not all, of the population. 
As a mission leader, I've been using Zoom for about the last three to four years with meetings with colleagues. Now, thanks to COVID, even my mother-in-law knows what Zoom is. Nearly every church member I know has participated in a Zoom service of some kind. The processes of digitalization that take, might have taken years under normal circumstances have taken place in a matter of weeks. The crisis has forced us to be creative and innovative. Back in June, June, the Church of England reported that 17,000 online services were available on their website. But as an, an extraordinary amount of effort was put into providing online worship services in the early months, many churches celebrated the numbers of those following their services online. But so many people have found, and I'm using this word carefully, excarnated worship, a very pale shadow of the real thing, non-embodied non worship, okay? is very unsatisfying. It's like decaffeinated coffee. You know, I have a decaf at nine o'clock at night because if I don't, I won't be able to sleep. But I love my coffee with, with caffeine. I love my worship where I can feel my brother and sister next to me and I can hear their voice on the back of my head. Um, that's what I yearn for. In the summer of uh, this year, the Barna Institute in the US published research on the impact of COVID on church attendance. They found that one third of Christians in the US were still and only attending their pre-COVID church. One third had either switched churches or were participating in multiple church services. And one third had stopped attending church altogether. I've got three kids, and that has been the experience of one of mine. She happened to be moving on from the city where she'd been studying and hadn't found a strong church to be part of. And she stopped being part of a regular church. Her family now is her church, and we're desperately trying to preach the gospel to her and hold her in in the midst of this all. There were lots of stories about how many fantastic Numbers of people were connecting up to worship services, more than that were normally there, but it's not everyone's experience. Church is about relationships, trust in God and in each other, and rootedness in a local community. COVID has highlighted again just how important rootedness is in real relationships, in our locality where we live in the communities that give our people, our, mean, our lives meaning. That's an opportunity for the church. For the real church is the local church. But we need to embrace this moment and reorientate our energies from just providing replacement worship services to meeting the needs of the vulnerable in our communities who are most impacted by the pandemic and building transformational relationships in smaller groups as we're able to. Lastly, we need to look at Europe through a spiritual lens, of course. For each of the lenses, I've given you a word, okay? For the political lens, nationalism. For the economic lens, debt. For the social lens, demographics. For the environmental lens, everything. For the technological lens, acceleration. And when it comes to the spiritual lens, there's so much going on, I could just not do justice to it at all in one. I could talk about the rise of people who say they have no religion, the, the huge proportion of young people particularly who've been saying that more and more over the last few decades. I could talk about nominal Christianity, the significant number of adults and surprising percentages of young people who still continue to identify as Christians. Or I could talk about the one in 20 Europeans who identify as Muslim and the prospect of growth in that number, but also the startling number of Muslim background believers that are coming to faith uh, around Europe. But whether we're, whether we're faced with a convinced atheist, a nominal Christian or a Muslim, 
I believe our place to begin in respect to our perspective should be the perspective of Christ, what he taught us. We read in Mark 6, 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. People are people. All of us can catch COVID. All of us without Christ are like sheep without a shepherd. It's not my favorite worship song, but it does contain a fundamental truth. Everyone needs compassion, the kindness of a savior. As you see the multitudes with their faces covered with masks walk by, whatever their spiritual condition, whether they have faith, don't have faith, they all need compassion. Many of them have lost friends or relatives or are struggling with mental health issues or heartache or separation from loved ones. So when you look through the spiritual lens, more than a label, think of people who need compassion. So there you have it. Not so much six trends as six words that serve as a challenge for reflection. Nominalism, debt, demographics, everything, acceleration, and people. But to finish, I want to share an image with you all. And um, I don't know whether that's uh, possible for me to, to well, I'll put it on the presentation. It's a painting by the Flemish painter Bruegel the Younger from 1626. It's a vision of Europe during the Little Ice Age. From the mid 14th to the mid 19th century, Europe experienced centuries of colder winters, which regularly saw all of the major rivers freeze over, like in the painting. It wasn't just a long winter, it was a long lasting and far reaching change in our circumstances in Europe with political, economic, social, environmental, technological and spiritual consequences that lasted for hundreds of years. The black swan of the COVID pandemic probably won't affect us for hundreds of years, but we will all remember 2020. And I think we will remember it not only as the year of COVID, but as the year that COVID began, rather like 1914 or 1945, the first year of COVID. Now there's value in identifying trends and suggesting how we might respond to them, but this is not only a task for futurologists, people who can uh, think into the future. This is a task for all of us, as Dave has reminded us. We are all having to think into tomorrow we're all having to take that field trip into the future. And that's something that all of us need to be engaged in. So at the end, I want to give a, an unapologetic plug to the Lausanne Europe conversation and to the impact groups that we're trying to start across Europe. Part of the vision for that is precisely about listening to as many possible people as we can to get as many people as possible engaged in a big conversation about what is needed in mission in Europe in such a way that we hear those voices, those unheard voices of migrant church leaders, of young people, of women, and so many others whose voices are often not present in the debate. Europe is too diverse and too dynamic to just have a few people with a platform who can speak about what things are happening. God is doing things everywhere. He is working in your lives and your ministries in, in amazing ways. And I've loved hearing Dave's testimony today. I'm looking forward to hearing yours one day about your trip into the future as well. So I'm gonna finish there. Um, I've got some questions, which I'm happy for you to discuss in the groups. Shall I put those on the chat? Okay. Yes, please do that. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Um, this is uh, very inspiring and challenging and, and gives a really good um, understanding of what is actually happening in Europe. 
and and I think it challenges us as a church, as young leaders, uh, where's our place in this? What is God uh, doing? Um, we'll we'll go into groups again, and and Jim gave us some questions. Um, so this group time will will last for uh, 20 25 minutes. We'll 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 call you back at 21 25. Uh, so you have a bit more than 20 minutes, and do two things. Talk about those questions for half the time, and then take half of the time to to pray for one another. Um, share, you know, I, I I really encourage you to 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 share. What is what is it that? Please pray for me for this. Yeah. Okay. So Janet, go ahead and send us into the groups. I wish I could have been in all of your groups, but man, too many <laughs> wonderful people on the call, Christian. We need to do it again. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This, is, this has been really, really, really good. And I can't wait to see you all uh, at real life. Um, although this is pretty real as well. Um, okay, guys, uh, mute yourself uh, if you're not muted. Um, I have two, I think there's two things I really would like to, to emphasize right now. And the first thing I think we, we just touched a little bit, you know, we're all leaders and we face, some of us face really rough situations. And I really like to say, if you don't have a mentor, you know, Lausanne is, is, is offering mentors and is offering help to find mentors. So, you know, write Evie or write someone else. Don't, don't carry your burdens alone. You're not supposed to um and and uh, uh second thing i think at least in our group i think in many groups we talked about okay how do we actually face for example loneliness as a, as a result of, of covid and and face different things and and um we were supposed to have nay dawson talking to us tonight about um how to do real community online um uh and how to face you know when we are just so sick and tired of internet and techniques and stuff but we we are called to be a church and we are called to 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 live uh and and to and to help a world which is lonely and to to face all these you know what can we do it how can we practically do it so we are we are going to we are already done, done a podcast with nay which will be available and we we are going to think about other options how to to get her insights in that uh onwards um so it's coming and also we have recorded tonight's uh, call so you can go back if you want to listen into some of it good so uh can i add something christian here yes <laughs> <laughs> um first okay. um with uh, with jim you know mentioned the impact groups we would love to start uh, some european younger leaders impact groups from january onwards so janet and i are two hosts for these impact groups. And so we would really love to offer that. I've got already three members, but I would love to have a bit more. And also Janet would like to see a group, you know, grow from various parts. So if you're interested in joining this new impact group, walking the journey with us for a year, once a month on a call, that would be really, really exciting um, to see how we can, you know, touch all these European topics and see how does it apply to our churches and so on and then also if you're interested in the global younger leaders generation of which and i and Ole, Ole magnus are part of the global leadership team of that where we have mentors as already christian said where we offer various gatherings and so on so you you're very invited to apply to that but also i would like to highlight that we have another younger leaders gathering planned in faith for next year and it's the first weekend in September 2nd to 5th of September we hope to go where well, we've booked Poland the H2O headquarter of Josiah Venture where Dave Paddy is from so that would be something to really look forward to and any of you also if you've never been to any of our gatherings you're very invited this is not an inclusive exclusive whatever meeting but we are integrative and we love to invest into young leaders so and also if you come out of this and you think, oh, I'm not sure if I need a mentor, but I would love to talk to someone, uh, you know, just once or whatever and have, a, have an issue, I would like someone to pray into that or walk the journey with me. We are also willing to do that um, as a team and also some of the mentors here are available. So it doesn't, you don't have to think of mentoring, you know, a long time period, but we are also here just for one off 
when you think I'm actually in a crisis right now, I don't know how to cope, or I have a question, mm -hmm. whatever, then we're here for you. Thanks, Evie. Oh, Thanks. Yeah. yeah, and and just to 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 underline that, um, in September you're all welcome, whether you've been there or not, uh, and we really want to kind of think about it as that you know, and also for you who have been part of it before, think of think of it as an opportunity for you to bring someone with you that you're co-leaning with or you're investing in. Uh, we really want to kind of think kind of movement-wise and relationship-wise. 2nd to 5th of September in Poland, by God's grace. Okay, so takeaway. Uh, if you all go back to the, to the, or this is a new Slido, so you have to yep. find a new one. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if there's one word to summarize, what do you take away from, from tonight? We're waiting in excitement. Who's going to be the first one? Encourage, great. <laughs> I like that one. I am. Joy, yeah, that's good. Oh, here's the Lord. Wishing and hope, simple lifestyle, inspiration, fellowship, engage, community. Thanks. Blessed. Perseverance, good one. We need that deep connection. Yeah, let us be connected, intercede. Yes, let's do that. European community. Yes. Impact. Yeah, let's have impact and let's join impact groups. Mm. <laughs> then we will have impact. For those of you who are already in an impact group, we are going to to make some slight changes so we can actually start really making it a conversation and, and starting through like giving feedback and talking back and forth we don't with, between the groups as well which is going to deep like bring it to another level of how to really make impact in europe ice age hmm interesting <laughs> could that person who wrote ice age give a little short why did you write Ice Age? <laughs> Voluntarily. Curiosity, reality, great. Well, that's a good, that's a beautiful picture. Can someone do, do a screenshot of that one? Evie already did it. <laughs> no, I, I, will, I will do a proper one. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, you can you 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 have it already. Okay, <laughs> or you have saved it. That's great. Okay, fantastic. Um, take it with you. Your takeaway. Take it with you into your everyday life, uh, and and then in the week coming up. Um, we are really grateful that Ola Magnus is with us. Uh, it's kind of the grandfather of of the YLG. Uh, uh, thank you so much for being with us and for your faithful and uh, uh, ministry to us and love uh, and would you please give us a blessing and uh, a good night message wow thank you how great it was to flock around jesus and one another again so so i'm happy when i see all the faces as you know um, god already told us how we could bless one another back in numbers six so let's just receive this old and simple and deep blessing from the Lord. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Blessing to you all.